Well, welcome. Uh, I'm Dr. Lewis Hassel, Professor of Pathology at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center, and uh, glad to have you with us. Uh, it's the uh, weekend before Christmas, so uh, number of attendees is a little bit down compared to usual, uh, but uh, most of these uh, sessions we record as well so that they're available for future viewing at uh, potentially more con convenient times. Uh, I'm going to uh, share my screen so that you can see the uh, uh, cases we're going to discuss today, which uh, include a number of uh, uh, bone cases. Uh, and uh, hopefully you'll see from that some of my approach to uh, uh, how to manage uh, bone cases and uh, the general approach that I take uh, in those uh, issues. So you should be able to see my screen now, and uh, this illustrates one of the important principles, which is you usually don't want to evaluate a bone lesion uh, unless you've also seen the radiograph, um, because the, the gross specimens are often very difficult to uh, uh, conceptualize, and the radiograph gives us uh, excellent uh, gross features of uh, the lesions. So this, as you can see, is an adult, an older uh, patient. Uh, there's a little bit of osteopenia here in the uh, uh, various areas. Um, and uh, as you can also see, we have a, a fracture and a very modeled appearance to the bone. As you trace along the cortex, you see there's multiple areas where we have uh, defects, we have lucency, we have sort of a variable uh, mineralization of the cortex. Um, and so in addition to this area where we actually have the fracture, we can also see that elsewhere in the bone, uh, we have an altered appearance. So this is the appearance of either uh, neoplastic uh, uh, primary uh, marrow disease, such as uh, myeloma or something like that, or potentially a metastatic uh, tumor of other sorts uh, that is creating this. Could this be a primary bone lesion like osteosarcoma? or something of that sort. I don't think so. Uh, first of the age group, it's much more likely to be thinking of uh, metastatic disease than primary bone disease. Uh, but uh, that would still be something worth keeping in mind, but it's certainly quite extensive. So let's see what the uh, histology shows us here uh, for this case. Uh, there we go. Um, so as you can see, we have kind of uh, fragments of tissue. It's very uh, bluish purple, uh, which obviously is uh, going to be uh, uh, neoplastic. And we don't see uh, any uh, bone formation or altered uh, uh, things of that sort. We don't have any matrix. We don't have glandular formation. So, uh, you know, we can probably exclude uh, many of the uh, uh, common carcinomas that uh, might go to the bone, like uh, prostate or uh, breast or other sorts of things. And we're looking at a very diffuse uh, cellular process. Um, when we come into a little higher magnification, I think we can appreciate that there's uh, some eccentricity to some of the nuclei, which generally are somewhat rounded. Um, Obviously, with digital slides, we don't have quite the same magnification characteristics or capabilities that we do in uh, primary samples. Um, but uh, you can see that the cytoplasm is uh, reasonably uh, abundant, and it's kind of this amphiphilic uh, purplish color. Um, where we do see some areas, the uh, eccentric nuclei, some of them have a little bit of a huff here, this little pale area there. Uh, so that would be, again, suggestive of a plasmacytic lesion. Um, lymphomas of bone, myeloma of bone, these are can be challenging diagnoses. Um, and uh, sometimes radiographically, we uh, may overlook those possibilities when we're looking at the bone lesions, particularly primary lymphoma of bone. Uh, myeloma may be a little bit more commonly encountered disorder. Uh, and that is in case, is certainly what the case is here. Now, of had they done a uh, serum protein electrophoresis or immunofixation electrophoresis or other measurement of uh, immunoglobulins, they may have uh, been able to uh, establish that diagnosis beforehand. But sometimes it is the biopsy that says, oh, 
this looks like a, a, a lymphoplasmacytic lesion, uh, rule out myeloma and so forth. So there's our first case. And uh, this was kind of a little bit of a soft, easy one to sort of get us uh, rolling into the uh, process of uh, evaluating cases. So we'll go on to the uh, next case. Um, and again, we have a uh, radiograph, uh, this uh, of, uh, again, of the arm. Um, and uh, it's a, a, an adult. We don't see any uh, residual epiphyseal uh, uh, <clears throat> changes here to indicate that the uh, patient was uh, an adolescent. Uh, we can see a little bit of variability in the marrow spaces here and so forth. Uh, these uh, little holes like this, sometimes these are vascular orifices, orifices uh, and do not necessarily reflect um, the, uh, the presence of a, a defect or something of that sort. Uh, what we are seeing, though, down here is we're seeing some variability to the uh, um, uh, bone structure here. As you see, there's some uh, scalloping or some uh, uh, irregular elevation of the uh, uh, Ulna, and uh, this indicates that we've got some sort of a uh, process going on here within the marrow space. And this is kind of in the metadiaphyseal region, so it does extend down here into the diaphysis. Uh, and here we can see it here on this uh, view here. Uh, the margins up here relatively sharp in some areas, um, and it seems to be that it may be sort of centered on the cort on the uh, cortex a little bit more uh, than uh, elsewhere. So uh, although the, there is a little bit of irregularity, by and large, this has a fairly uh, uh, defined uh, margin. It doesn't look particularly infiltrative or destruction destructive. There's not much in the way of periosteal reaction. Uh, so we don't see any Codman's triangle or anything like that that's uh, elevating the periosteum, uh, and we don't have a, any sort of fracture here as well. So uh, we would expect this to be a relatively lower-grade lesion, um, and uh, we'll see here what we have. So these are the this is the sample from this uh, sample tissue, and as you can see, it's very low cellularity, a lot of pink. Uh, again, we're not seeing any uh, particular structure in terms of ossification, um, and we do have, uh, you know, a little bit of increased cellularity here. Um, but as we come into higher magnification, we can see that these are, um, you know, fibroblastic uh, type cells, uh, sort of weakly or vaguely spindly in appearance. There's a delicate vasculature. And a few scattered inflammatory cells uh, in the midst of this. Um, as we look a little further, uh, here you can see some more <clears throat> ionized collagen or more fibrotic appearance. Uh, and this, this is a good indication that we have a, a fair uh, uh, chronicity in this lesion. Um, uh, here we see you know, some histiocytes, a uh, little bit of loosening of the uh, otherwise uh, collagenous stroma. So we're not seeing any ossification here. Uh, we see a cortical-based lesion by and large with low-grade margins. Uh, so this is a, uh, you know, if you were to see this on frozen section, you might say sort of something to the effect of, uh, you know, low-grade spindle cell lesion or spindle cell tissue um, and no evidence of malignancy, that sort of thing. Uh, but given the radiographic appearance and this tissue kind of appearance, uh, the fact that it's mostly a cortical-based, uh, we could classify this as a non-ossifying fibroma uh, of bone. Uh, we do have, as we said, a little bit of areas of uh, um, a little bit more fibrotic tissue. And maybe, oh, I suppose if you looked around, you might be able to find a giant cell or two here. Maybe there's Maybe that's a slight giant cell. Uh, sometimes you can get these areas of hemorrhage, uh, and this is a lesion that can produce uh, uh, an aneurysmal bone cyst as a secondary change uh, on occasion, but uh, not something that we're seeing at this uh, uh, particular case. So uh, contrast to the prior uh, situation, a very low-grade benign appearing lesion, 
Um, and these lesions tend to be cortical, uh, cortical uh, but uh, in, a, in, a more, uh, in a more central location or more medullary location, uh, the non-oxifying fibroma, uh, the uh, cortical only uh, load lesions are oftentimes just called a, a fibrous cortical defect. Uh, these are essentially the same uh, lesion uh, and not something that uh, creates any sort of adverse uh, uh, prognosis uh, for the patient. All right, we'll go on to case three. Again, starting with the radiograph. So we've moved to the lower extremity here. Um, and uh, this is a lesion that sometimes uh, our uh, students have some difficulty with. You know, you kind of go, where's the lesion? You know, and, uh, you know, if you look at the, the uh, 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 excuse me, the, a, the PA view here, you may think, uh, well, is it is it this? You know, because sometimes the patella overlying the femur can look like a lesion, and you can can think that that's what you're you're dealing with. Uh, but I think this is our lesion right here in the uh, uh, epiphysis of the uh, uh, tibia. Uh, and uh, as you see, we're in an adult. Uh, we can still see a little trace of the uh, uh, epiphyseal plate. Uh, but our lesion here looks to be in the epiphysis. And uh, as you can see, it's got very pretty well-defined margins, a slight de degree of sclerosis around the uh, periphery of it uh, here. Um, and uh, so that's uh, location. Now, the epiphysis is an important location. There are relatively few things uh, that occur in the epiphysis uh, as an isolated location. And so uh, being familiar with those lesions uh, is uh, very important. Uh, we'll do, we're going to skip the MRI. I, I don't think I want to go into that uh, at this point. Um, so uh, one of those lesions is chondroblastoma, uh, but there are occasions when uh, the uh, um, when other lesions will cross the epiphyseal plate, and as we indicated, this is an adult. Um, and so a metaepiphyseal lesion uh, can uh, include uh, other entities uh, as well. Uh, so again, we've got quite blue tissue. Uh, we've got uh, fragments. Uh, we have uh, a little bit more collagenization in some areas. And then I think you can see here, we also have a, a, a variety of giant cells in some of the areas of this tumor here we can Come down here and you can see those, uh, pick those up quite nicely here. Uh, and we don't have a high degree of pleomorphism. Uh, now we would suggest or suspect from the radiograph that our margins were fairly sharply defined and not, uh, this was not going to be an aggressive lesion. Uh, so finding uh, uh, abundant giant cells with this uh, matrix of uh, stromal cells that uh, are really quite bland uh, and are not making bone, uh, vascular background. Uh, these are things that would <clears throat> help us to uh, appreciate this lesion as being uh, on the benign side or very low grade side of things. Um, and uh, so given the uh, appearance, given the presence of giant cells, uh, you know, which of course you can see in many different lesions, uh, we're really looking to exclude any areas of cartilage or osseous uh, formation. So we can see that, that there, these cells are really quite bland. There's a little bit of atypia. This is the beginning of a giant cell there. Um, and so I think uh, this would fit into the category of a giant cell tumor. Uh, now, there are some immunohistochemical stains that uh, uh, can be useful in establishing that diagnosis uh, now. Uh, I grew up in the era before that was the case, uh, so I don't have them on the tip of my tongue. I always have to go look them up. And I usually go to places like Path Outlines and so forth because they, those uh, tend to be up to date and have uh, nice summaries of uh, positive and negative staining. Now, here we've got what might be a, a ring mitosis. Uh, and another mitosis there. So occasional mitoses can be seen in uh, giant cell tumors. Uh, that's not uh, 
contraindication to that diagnosis. Um, and this is illustrative of uh, a relatively giant cell pore lesion. Uh, we don't have uh, uh, a lot of giant cells in every area, um, but we've excluded any evidence of uh, cartilaginous disease. Uh, it's got a radiographically bland border. Uh, and one of the things that, that we think of histologically is, you know, you look at the uh, nuclei in the uh, stromal cells, and generally they look fairly low grade and, and quite similar to those in the giant cells. Um, that's not an absolute criteria, but it's a, a useful uh, one in this setting. So uh, one example of a giant cell tumor of bone uh, that had uh, sort of crossed the epiphyses or the epiphysis and was a metaepiphyseal uh, type of lesion. Now, sometimes you can get a bit of this kind of a hyaline uh, pink material like this, a very fibrinoid uh, appearance. And sometimes this can congeal and begin to look like osteoid, uh, raising the uh, concern for uh, uh, malignant uh, osteosarcoma. And indeed, some of the highest grade osteosarcomas form very little osteoid. Um, so uh, one of the things that can be useful in that uh, differential diagnosis is to uh, use polarized light microscopy uh, and look at this substance under uh, polarized light uh, because the polarization characteristics of fibrin and osteoid are different. Um, with osteoid, you should get some uh, lamellar uh, type of appearance uh, to that, which will be birefringent. Whereas with osteoid, or excuse me, with uh, fibrin, you don't get that appearance. Uh, so that's uh, sometimes useful to keep that handy. Now, many microscopes, and of course, digital microscopy doesn't make that possible, uh, but um, uh, you can uh, get uh, reasonably good function if you just buy a cheap pair of polarizing sunglasses and manage to interpose those uh, between the... Uh, light path uh, on your uh, conventional microscope. Uh, hopefully at some point down the road, we'll have uh, uh, digital microscopes that can do uh, more advanced things like uh, immunofluorescence and polarized light. But for now, uh, we're, uh, that, that's one of the things where you need a conventional microscope. All right, so uh, if we have questions as we go along, please don't hesitate to type those into the chat. Uh, we'll try to deal with those either as I notice them or at the end of our session this morning. So moving on to our next case, uh, here's a lesion that's sort of out in the uh, uh, diaphysis, a little bit further away from the joint space, again, uh, around the knee. Uh, and uh, this has this kind of uh, popcorn pattern of calcification, as well as a number of uh, ring uh, structures uh, within rounded lesion areas within the lesion. Um, and so, uh, and, and I'll just uh, comment here on this is this, this uh, particular radiographic study. Uh, this is actually a, uh, uh, the old uh, tomograph uh, uh, technique where the, uh, a single plane of focus is uh, utilized in the bone to uh, give you better resolution on an intraosseous lesion. Uh, so this is not a, uh, a conventional uh, radiograph, but we can still evaluate uh, the uh, cortex. Uh, we can see that this is, is not really altering that, and at least in this view, uh, appears to be uh, intramedullary. So uh, this radiographic appearance with sort of uh, these rounded spaces, peripheral calcification would be quite uh, characteristic of a uh, uh, cartilaginous lesion with uh, areas of uh, peripheral uh, uh, calcification uh, in the lesion. And so we would suspect that this is uh, either an enchondroma or a uh, chondrosarcoma. So indeed, here at low magnification, you can see the uh, curettings. Uh, and that would be the conventional approach to this type of a lesion would be to curette it rather than uh, excise it, uh, given the uh, mineralization uh, pattern that you saw there. And we do see uh, areas of uh, uh, you know, dense purple material here, 
that correspond to those uh, peripheral zones of uh, uh, calcification that we saw. Uh, and of interest here is we're really not seeing any uh, evidence of uh, endochondral pattern uh, ossification, but we've just got little fragments of bone uh, and uh, uh, calcification within the cartilage itself, uh, rather than uh, sort of a, any osteoid formation. Now, uh, looking and turning our attention to the, uh, the uh, cartilaginous matrix, uh, we can see here that we have uh, uh, fairly solid, but a little bit of watery change to it. Uh, and as we look at the uh, uh, lacunae, uh, we can see that they're reasonably close together. Now, cartilag cart cartilaginocytes or chondrocytes uh, uh, tend to uh, be uh, single nuclei within a lacunae. Uh, and when you start to see uh, more than one nucleus in a lacunae, uh, and you start to see uh, lacunae that are fused or close together, you, you do begin to worry about the possibility of uh, low-grade malignancy. Um, and so in this particular case, we are seeing some of those changes. So, so although we have mostly single uh, chondrocytes in the, the lacunae, we're beginning to see a little bit of fusion uh, and a few cells uh, more closely opposed to one another uh, than uh, we would otherwise. Uh, when we begin to see myxoid changes to the cartilage, that also is a, a marker for a little bit more uh, aggressive behavior. Uh, and here, here we see a binucleate uh, chondrocyte or bi two nuclei within a lacunae. Uh, so that, that also is a marker for uh, increasing uh, possibility of proliferative changes. Uh, so, uh, you know, if this were uh, in a very peripheral location, say, you know, the hand or the fingers or something like that, uh, we would probably not pay too much attention to that. But when we begin to see two and three uh, chondroid nuclei, we should be thinking of a, uh, a well-differentiated, low-grade uh, chondrosarcoma. Uh, now, having said that, uh, that's uh, not going to make a huge difference in management uh, because uh, the uh, treatment for low-grade chondrosarcoma and for enchondromas is uh, by and large pretty similar uh, Follow-up might be a little bit different, uh, but really when they bring you this kind of material on uh, frozen section and so forth, what they're asking the answer on is, are there any areas of dedifferentiation? Are there any areas of high-grade change? Because that will change their management, both intraoperatively and postoperatively. Uh, and so uh, you want to be uh, able to clue in on that and look for any areas of high cellularity, uh, solid uh, tissue type growth or uh, completely mixoid uh, changes, uh, which we don't see any of that here. And that uh, corresponds to the radiographic appearance that we had with, uh, you know, that popcorn pattern, fairly localized appearance and so forth. So uh, my diagnosis on this case was a, a grade one a chondrosarcoma, low grade, um, and uh, I suppose uh, one could, could make the case that, uh, you know, if this were in the finger, you might not even call it that um, because uh, the, in the fingers, they, they tend to behave uh, more uh, uh, indolently, uh, but in a uh, long bone or in the pelvis, uh, someplace like that, you, you do potentially have a higher risk of uh, uh, eventual dedifferentiation in these lesions and development of a uh, more aggressive uh, uh, sarcoma. Okay, so uh, welcome to those of you who've uh, joined uh, a little bit uh, late. Uh, we're going through some bone cases and uh, uh, feel free to type in your questions. Here's another example uh, of uh, the uh, type of histologic changes you can get. Uh, here uh, is uh, uh, what we were referring to where you begin to get more myxoid changes uh, increase in cellularity and so forth. I don't think this uh, particular lesion is uh, yet uh, to the uh, stage of uh, uh, high-grade chondrosarcoma, but it's beginning to show features uh, of uh, concern. Um, and uh, one of these features is this permeation within uh, existing uh, medullary spaces. 
Uh, and another feature that uh, some people use is uh, the beginnings of a sort of uh, invasion into the, the bony spicules themselves. Now, sometimes in these lesions, you can get uh, areas of uh, secondary fracture. Uh, so you have to be careful in uh, misinterpret to not misinterpret a fracture callus uh, or reactive peripheral ossification uh, as uh, evidence of uh, uh, bone differentiation and, and there, therefore you moving it to something where you would might consider the diagnosis of a chondroblastic osteosarcoma, uh, which would be one of the things in the differential to, uh, to be aware of, uh, but not something that you should... Uh, uh, Again, something where you need to be looking at the uh, radiograph to see uh, and make sure that, that what you're seeing histologically is going to correspond to that uh, sort of change. Okay. All right. So back to the knee joint. And here's a younger patient. Here we can see... Uh, open uh, epiphyses, not, not yet fused completely, uh, both in the femur and the tibia. And here we see this very nice, lucent um, uh, epi excuse me, epiphyseal uh, lesion uh, with a, a lucency and a fairly sharp margins, not infiltrative, not uh, violating the uh, epiphyseal plate. So in a uh, pre-adolescent, uh, this lesion uh, radiographically <clears throat> would be uh, almost uh, certainly a, uh, a, a chondroblastoma um, because there are very few other things in the uh, adolescent state of life that occur in this location. So uh, radi radiologists who uh, know their bone uh, disease will uh, make that diagnosis or suggest that diagnosis. And likewise, pathologists should be aware of that. So uh, this is a, an interesting lesion because it can, uh, uh, can be somewhat deceptive because it's quite cellular, as you see here. Um, and although it tends to be lucent, radiolucent, it can at times have this very uh, unique pattern of uh, calcification that has uh, sometimes been called uh, chicken wire pattern uh, calcification. Now we can see that it has evidence of a chondroid differentiation here, you can see that. Uh, but then what happens is you get this pattern of pericellular uh, calcification uh, virtually around the lacunae or around the individual cells uh, that gives it that appearance of uh, having a, a lattice work or a uh, so-called chicken wire pattern of calcification. Uh, now, these lesions can have uh, occasional giant cells, as you see here. Uh, but as we look at these uh, cells, these are different than the, those that we see in giant cell tumor. Um, they, they have more rounded cytoplasm. They're more discrete cells. Um, and the, uh, the giant cells are, are similar. Uh, but the background stromal cells are quite different. And then this pattern of uh, calcification, pericellular calcification, the chondroid matrix that you'll see in areas uh, are uh, the uh, you know, confirming diagnostic changes that allow you to make that diagnosis of chondroblastoma. Now, we have here also in this sample a fragment of uh, what looks like uh, quite mature cartilage uh, with, uh, you know, round chondrocytes and a very uniform matrix. Uh, what is this? Well, there are two possibilities here. One is that this is a piece of the epiphyseal plate that has been snagged in the process of getting to this lesion because uh, getting to the epiphysis uh, is uh, pretty challenging. You can't go through the joint uh, space per se um, to uh, get to the ep epiphysis. So typically you have to traverse the uh, uh, epiphyseal plate to sample uh, a lesion in the uh, uh, epiphysis. And that's likely what's happened here. Now, the other alternative is that they actually did go through the joint and sample this uh, transarticularly, uh, although I doubt that that's the case. It could be because there is a little bit of a articular type of pattern here, or conceivably also they could have inadvertently snagged a piece of the uh, thinned um, 
subchondral uh, bone and associated uh, articular cartilage, uh, leaving a small defect there. Uh, you can see why uh, examining all of the sample is important because I think if you were to just look at a field like this, uh, you might make the diagnosis of giant cell tumor. It looks very similar to our earlier uh, case. Uh, but when you see the periphery of this area here, this nice calcification pattern and a more chondroid, uh, a chondroblastic appearance here. So uh, chondroblastoma, um, late adolescence, epiphysis, those are the things you, uh, you need to remember. Uh, for uh, diagnosing this lesion. Uh, it usually is uh, osteolytic as well. All right, we've well, got some more cases uh, coming up here. We'll see if we can get to the next case. Uh, here is uh, a lesion again, where we it looks like we have uh, open epiphyses. Now I will mention here that uh, uh, MRI is not optimal for examining uh, the uh, bone component of a lesion. Uh, it tends to have very little MRI signal, so it's dark, as you can see here. Uh, but we do see that uh, there is a lesion here that crosses the epiphysis, involves the metaphysis, slightly alters the cortex, but doesn't appear to raise or expand, or certainly extend beyond there. There's also heterogene heterogeneity in the lesion, uh, and so this would be a classic MRI appearance for a giant cell tumor. Uh, but uh, given uh, other possibilities here, it could be uh, with this, this pattern here, this could be the beginnings of an osteosarcoma. So you, you do want to consider the other possibilities. Although the peripheral margin here, quite well-defined, a little bit of a loosened uh, rim indicating probably some degree of ossification there at the periphery. So we'll pull up the slide. And uh, here we see, again, very uh, bluish tissue, some areas of hemorrhage. Uh, these are lesions that can produce uh, aneurysmal bone cysts as a secondary phenomenon. Um, and uh, as we come into low, higher magnification, you can see just lots and lots of giant cells in this lesion. Some areas of hemorrhage that we've noted. And here you see more of that. Uh, now, you can uh, get areas of microfracture in giant cell tumors that will produce a secondary kind of uh, uh, reactive woven bone formation uh, pattern. Uh, you can get lots of hemorrhage and loosening of the tissue. So finding sort of loose tissue like this is, is uh, common in giant cell tumor. Uh, we saw earlier on the prior case that you got areas of histiocyte deposition. That can also be there. And here's an example of some of this sort of secondary uh, <clears throat> bony change. This is not a primary tumor bone. Uh, this is, uh, looks like a, a pre-adolescent uh, cortical bone uh, with a little bit of reactive change here and a little bit of periosteum uh, that's uh, come in with the uh, curettings. Uh, they've included uh, some other uh, bony tissue here. So uh, you look at this bone, uh, and you see nice uh, lamellae. You see these uh, parallel lines here. Those, that's indi an indication that the bone has been uh, reorganized from its initial uh, formation. Uh, and that process is usually complete by the early 20s in an individual. Uh, prior to that time, you may have still some primary bone uh, pattern rather than the secondary lamellar bone that's been remodeled as part of the physiologic uh, growth process. So uh, the areas of hemorrhage can be of concern. Uh, and one of the things you want to be aware of is that sometimes uh, uh, aneurysmal or angiotatic uh, uh, osteosarcoma can have a very uh, osteoid poor and vascular rich uh, pattern. But in that lesion, you should, should see uh, abundant atypia in the uh, uh, stromal cells. Here we see there's some areas of uh, hemosiderin deposition, this brownish pigment, uh, and that's indication that there's been kind of uh, some chronic uh, leaky bleeding uh, into the lesion with a uh, breakdown of the uh, uh, 
uh, pigments. Here you see more of this uh, pigmentation change uh, here. And you know this in all possible probability is part of what uh, uh, accounts for that difference on the MRI uh, because the uh, uh, polarization uh, re magnetic resonance uh, characteristics of uh, this type of iron pigments of this sort would be different than uh, what you would expect in the surrounding uh, tissues. Uh, so that's uh, another radiographic clinical correlation or histologic correlation that you should be aware of. Okay, so I think uh, if I'm not incorrect, I may have included a number of other examples of, uh, I think I did include a number of other um, uh, histologic examples of uh, giant cell tumor. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that because I'd like to go on and discuss a, another case here, uh, but you have other histologic examples of uh, giant cell tumor uh, that you can uh, refer to. Uh, all right, so here's a, a, another uh, adolescent. You see the open epiphysis here, and we've got a nice magnified view of a slight swelling to the uh, cortex and thinning of the cortex here. Uh, margins are kind of indeterminate a little bit. There's a little haziness to that. But for the most part, this appears to be sort of circumscribed and rounded uh, in this lesion. Now, uh, this patient had uh, some pain associated with this lesion. I believe we've got a CT scan here as well. Nope, we don't, okay. All right, so this patient had some pain associated with this lesion. And as we look at this lesion, we can see that uh, there is a very uh, abundant bone formation and it's coming out of this abnormal appearance, uh, this abnormal tissue. Uh, we've got a lot of giant cells here and then we've got all this uh, tumor bone that's being formed here. So uh, is this, uh, you know, if I just showed you this picture, you would say, well, this is a bone forming tumor. This could be osteosarcoma. Uh, and that's true. Uh, and you should look and evaluate the degree of atypia that you have here. But given that radiographic appearance that we've just shown, very sharply circumscribed cortical-based lesion uh, with lucency and a little bit of peripheral uh, sort of uh, sclerosis to it, and the history of pain, uh, that should alert you to the possibility of an osteoid osteoma in this age group. Uh, because usually by the time osteosarcomas present, they're bigger, they're big lesions, whereas osteoid osteoma tends to be a tiny, a small lesion uh, and uh, uh, very lucent with somewhat circumscribed margins. So here they've gotten essentially the entire lesion. They've got the nidus here, as we see here in these fragments. They've got a bit of the peripheral reaction, which you can see here. Uh, there's a uh, some sort of reactive bone formation. You see all this osteoblastic rimming and this uh, sort of uh, uh, new bone formation here, quite cellular, not yet uh, reorganized and so forth. Um, and then you've got some peripheral areas here uh, with more fibrous tissue, a little bit of uh, hemosiderin deposition and so forth uh, around this as well. So uh, this is the histologic appearance of an osteoid osteoma. Uh, and it corresponds to this very osteoblastic uh, pattern of uh, bone deposition. Now, there's another lesion that looks uh, exactly like this, and that's osteoblastoma. Um, and that can be very more osteoblastic, but can also have a lytic component, a comb combination lytic blastic. And we might ask ourselves, why is this... Uh, this is new bone, but why is it not uh, brighter on the uh, uh, the X-ray? Why is that center not uh, more uh, radio dense uh, rather than showing up as radiolucent? Uh, and the reason is is because this, although this is osteoid, it's not yet fully mineralized, and so you have this uh, uh, lytic process uh, followed by this osteoblastic uh, process. Uh, that does not uh, completely mineralize. And so you get this uh, uh, radiographic appearance of a lucency 
uh, although microscopically here you have a very osteoblastic uh, pattern. Um, <clears throat> and so again, not a lot of atypia in these cells, uh, but very nice example of uh, tumor produced osteoid and what that would look like. Now, if you see significant high-grade atypia in these lesions um, uh, with atypical mitoses or a high degree of mitotic activity, then you should begin to think of more aggressive osteoblastomas or possibly osteosarcoma. But I would be very careful to make that diagnosis without uh, that you should really never make that diagnosis on the basis of this kind of tissue without seeing the x-ray. And having seen our x-ray, uh, as we've indicated here, it's a very uh, bland uh, radiographic appearance. We don't have a, a Codman's triangle. It's not a rapid growth. We don't have an infiltrative pattern, uh, and it's only marginally uh, altering the architecture of the, uh, of the bone here. So uh, some important lessons with osteoblast, uh, excuse me, osteoid osteoma. Okay, well, I think we've got time for uh, another case here. Uh, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Um, uh, this is a, another example, I think, of osteoblastoma, or excuse me, osteoid osteoma, where you see there's more uh, of this uh, bony uh, pattern, uh, but it's, uh, again, still showing uh, fairly uniform material. Let's just make sure that that's the case, because this is a rather, yeah, this was uh, classified as a osteoid osteoma. This was from the cervical spine. So locations can really be anywhere in the bone. It can be in the spine, in the um, pelvis, shoulder girdle, long bones on occasion. I don't think I've ever seen it in the hands, but uh, it's certainly possible as well. Uh, one unique thing about the uh, pain from this lesion is that it's uh, remarkably uh, uh, alleviated by um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory agents. So if you get that history that the patient has pain at night and so forth, and they take uh, you know some uh, <clears throat> a non-steroidal agent, uh, even Tylenol potentially, and get relief, then that's pretty good uh, uh, indication that you're dealing with uh, with that. All right, well, here's a plain film uh, that uh, introduces us to some new terminology. We see the lesion here and we see the epiphyseal plate. Uh, it's respecting the epiphyseal plate, but it's not so respectful of the cortex. As you can see here, we have some elevation of the cortex with a Codman's triangle, and it looks like we've got a little bit of uh, sort of starry uh, or sunburst appearance. Uh, and this lesion is uh, forming bone. It's, it's hyper uh, dense on uh, plain film. Uh, I think we may have an additional study here as well. Uh, here we can see the MRI, uh, which as you can see, again, it doesn't show you much about that, but it does show us that this is a lesion that is extending uh, into uh, the soft tissue, uh, maybe even abutting the neurovascular bundle here. Uh, and influencing even the periosteum of the uh, fibula as well. Uh, so this is a concerning lesion. We can see these uh, sort of rays of sunburst pattern uh, in that uh, with the elevation of the periosteum. So this is a concerning lesion. As, and as you can see within the bone, uh, it's got a, a hypo-intense lesion relative to the uh, uh, adjacent marrow, uh, although it does here have a fairly sharp margin which is interesting. So here's a biopsy. This was a core biopsy, obviously. Um, and this uh, tells us a lot just at low power. Uh, so we can see uh, the normal uh, bony spicules here, and we see a uh, infiltrative process in between those spicules. So we have, uh, uh, here's the epiphyseal plate here, and we see a pattern of uh, infiltrative growth uh, within the bone. Uh, and as we come into higher magnification, here we can see, uh, again, this kind of pattern of uh, ossification uh, 
variably mineralized and a quite uh, a sclerotic background. Now, <clears throat> this is a uh, pattern of uh, disease that sometimes people are reluctant to make the correct diagnosis. And that's part of the reason I show you is because this is an example of sclerosing osteosarcoma. Um, and the clues here are this infiltrative pattern, not, uh, you know, not destroying, but not respecting the pre-existing bone. Uh, the very uh, abnormal mineralization and bony pattern, but a relatively low degree of cytologic atypia. So this is uh, even less atypical, perhaps, than that uh, prior osteoblastoma that, or excuse me, osteoid osteoma that we looked at. But this has uh, a different radiographic appearance uh, and it has a different histologic appearance because it's destroying and infiltrating in through the marrow uh, in this uh, particular case. Uh, so you might have to hunt to find very much in the way of cytologic atypia. There is a, a degree of cytologic atypia here. It's not pronounced. There's just sort of subtle uh, changes, but you've got osteoid formation. You've got a subtle degree of uh, atypia to the uh, uh, stromal cells. And then you have this abnormal radiograph and infiltrative growth. And those all add up to a diagnosis of sclerosing osteosarcoma. Now, this is an important diagnosis to make because um, delay in diagnosis uh, can make a difference in terms of management on the patient. And I recall in particular one notable case that I saw a few years ago when I was uh, living in Hanoi, uh, where it took three biopsies before uh, the uh, uh, family and the pathologists that were seeing it were convinced that it was osteosarcoma, even though the radiologist from the very get-go had said, this is osteosarcoma because of that kind of appearance that we just saw. Uh, the family didn't want to accept that. The doctors wanted to hope for something better because it was a notable patient and notable family and so forth. And so some social uh, factors got into, into play, uh, potentially uh, influencing uh, the uh, ability of the uh, pathologist to uh, make the diagnosis. Um, but cellularity can be low. Uh, but an infiltrative pattern. And you can actually see here, there's, there's even some degree of uh, uh, bony spicule necrosis that's been induced by the tumor. But here you see the atypia, even in these uh, slightly necrotic uh, areas of this tumor. Well, uh, we've come to the uh, top of the hour. Uh, you've been with me for a good number of minutes. Uh, let's just take a minute and pause here and see if anyone has any questions that you'd like to bring up uh, relative to our uh, cases. Well, uh, not, uh, not seeing any, uh, uh, certainly you're welcome to uh, email me directly afterwards if something uh, comes up to mind. Oh, 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 there we go. I see there's a couple of comments. Okay, we'll just take the call. Oh, you're very welcome. Thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we will uh, meet again uh, the, the third week, uh, third Friday in January, uh, and uh, we will put that notice on uh, Pathalyst as well as on our uh, Facebook group. Um, and uh, I believe we have a guest uh, guest lecturer uh, coming for that point, so we'll uh, we'll give you the uh, details as we get closer to that date. So again, thanks everyone for joining us, and uh, until next time, I'll see you then. Good luck and happy holidays to all of you.